And I get a chance to share this moment with one part of our worship team, Andrea Marshall. And Andrea, it's a single other team, and it's been here for about, coming up on three years, right? So, Andrea, why don't you take a seat, and we're going to talk a little bit about your story. And um, this water series has given us a chance to learn not only from God in the Bible, but learn from people here at Vision. And so, Andrea, thank you, thank you for being willing to share your story today. So let's start off with some pictures, all right? Put some pictures. Uh, first of all, you and Patrick, and you guys, you back got married, and then transitioned to the next one. We can see you guys as a married couple. Why don't you kind of give us some back backstory, background on you guys as a couple, you can come into your vision, tell us a little bit. Okay. Um, so Patrick and I actually grew up together. We met in middle school, and uh, we were high school sweethearts. We did it all through high school, and then um, my freshman year of college, I moved to Argentina for this study abroad program, he stayed in the States. So when we got back together, we had a really difficult conversation and broke up. Um, so fast forward five years, we didn't talk to each other for five years, and he sent me a Facebook message and was like, hey, we're in the same area, let's get together. I'm like, that's random, but sure, okay. Um, and then, long story short, uh, six months later we were engaged, and six months later we were married. Um, we uh, lived in Cary for a couple years, we moved uh, to Gastonia um, after that because Patrick got a job here. And we looked and looked and looked for churches uh, for a really long time. And it was super discouraging. And then we were at the grocery store where we saw a sign for vision. And we were like, hey, we're going to visit that uh, church. Why not? We visited everywhere else in Gastonia. Um, yeah. so <laughs> visit us last. Take the best of us. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so we fell in love with it, and um, and somewhere on that journey, okay. little Addie came in, right? So let's, uh, let's see that, that pretty little girl, Addie. Addie. She came on scene, and um, if, if you say we went on, went to serve with her, she's back there at preschool. You can do a background <laughs> check and serve on her biscuits team. We would love to have you in there, loving on those kids. It's not childcare; it truly is ministry at the youngest of age. And then, of course, that picture of you and her. She's such a cute. Love that girl. Now, you know, I got to know this family. They were sitting right around there in our pre-launch days. We hadn't even opened as a church yet. We were meeting every other week doing training camp. And I saw them come in, and it was so cool. We talked, and I went to their house and got to know them, that they had been a part of a church plant up in the Triangle area. And I thought, God is bringing people here to help us grow. And we only had like 100 people at that time. And he was bringing people that had been through some of this process and wanted to come in and and help and serve and give and invite. And you guys have been so involved. And you know, whether it's singing, you know, we were at camp last week with students, uh, you know, Patrick had served in preschool. And well, why don't you, skipping ahead, why don't you tell us about Patrick? And coming up this fall, it'll have been two years since what happened with Patrick. So if you will, tell us that. Um, so in November of 2015, my husband and my brother-in-law and his brothers were um, went to South Carolina to do a spark race, which is like a huge obstacle course, basically like a 12-mile mud run situation. So um, they go to the Spartan race. Um, everybody's you know fine after. I, uh, I called to check in um, with Patrick, and they had stopped for gas. So I called and checked in, and, and I was like, hey, you know, how things going? Um, I'm going to be giving Addy a bath, so I can't really answer my phone for the next 15 or 20 minutes um, and he was joking about how tired he was he wanted to binge watch Netflix all day on Sunday and you know just a normal conversation love you bye um, so I found out uh, later that about 30 seconds uh, to a minute after that conversation he said I don't feel very well I just kind of fell over um, and there was a doctor there at the gas station who performed CPR, and then they performed CPR in the ambulance, and then again at the hospital for um, about 45 minutes, they worked on him, and he just never woke back up. Um, he had a brain aneurysm, brought on by physical exertion, and then combined with his high blood pressure and, and all that. Um, he was 29, and I remember being in the car, we um, were on the way to the hospital, everybody had told me that I thought he just passed out, was like, you know, dehydrated. So nobody had told me the gravity of the situations around the way to the hospital. And my dad got a call from my sister, and um, 
Um, he, he looked over at me and he said, um, uh, baby girl, Patrick didn't make it. And I said, it was like, he didn't make it. Like, you know, what do you mean? He just passed out. You know, that was my thought process. So, um, uh, um, so initially I had a pretty, like, you know, more visceral, like, physical, emotional reaction, and then, you know, a few minutes went by, and I just kind of got numb, and I was in shock, and my logical brain took over, and I started making a list, of, okay, what do I need to do? Like, what are my roles now? What am I going to have to do when I get home tonight? Um, it was that. Uh, sure. I, I, was, I can't even remember who called me. Somebody called me within minutes after that and told me something like it's a family member. And it just it just did not seem possible. 29 years old, I mean, we, I mean, we did ministry here every Sunday. And, and several of our kids, we, we even sang together on Father's Day that year. We put a little, a little group of guys up here and we sang. And he was just so vibrant, full of life. And we talked later that evening just in shock. I, just, I, just, I could not understand. And trust me, it's, it's not any easier on, on a pastor. It's not any easier on a, a guy, a friend, a, a man. So after those first couple of days, we put together the plans for the funeral, and I, I was so honored that I had a chance to partner with another pastor uh, from their past, and we, we officiated the service together. And uh, that was, I guess, part of the way that God kind of reaching out and, and helping you through the storm. Why don't you kind of tell us I mean, how how God walked you through the storm and then possibly is still walking you through it, but in, in that early time, you know, how, how'd that go? Um, I uh, could literally talk for like 12 hours about this. It's um, There's so many ways that God, so many things that God used and uh, grand gestures and subtle things and um, but the first thing that comes to mind when I think about how God walked me through this journey is uh, I think about the people that he used. Um, people texted me, they called me, they took me out for coffee, they left me presents on my doorstep, they let me scream and cry and rant and rave, you know, as much as I needed to. And um, I really reap the benefits of the obedience of other people in following God's prompting. Um, and it it was healing for me, and it meant the world. Um, one story in particular, uh, this is probably the most like poignant moment in my journey so far, is um, I, I kind of had a phrase to describe God's relationship to me and Addie and during this time, and that was that he was wrapping us up. So that's kind of the picture I had, you know, a safe, comfort, um, peaceful place. And... On our anniversaries, he, was, he passed in November, we, were, we had been married in May, so on our fifth anniversary that next May, I get this package in the mail. It didn't have a name on it, it just was from Wisconsin. And I opened it up, and there's a note, and it said, uh, it was this beautiful quilt that somebody had handmade um, for us, and it said, made with love and prayer for you and Addie. And um, I was like, who do I know in Wisconsin? Uh, what is happening? And um, I found out later it was actually a girl that I hadn't talked to in 12 years. Um, well, I didn't really know her anymore, but she, following God's leading, and something that could have been awkward, or, you know, I don't know, she quilted us this blanket that we could wrap ourselves in. And it was the most, it was the perfect thing for her to have done. And she didn't know that. She didn't know it was our anniversary. She had no idea. Um, but it was just kind of those those things from God and how he how he used other people um, is, is incredible. Some of the ways that I saw how God used other people was as we prepared for that funeral, um, people in our church said, how, how can we help? What can we do? And it was so neat to see the kids say, we want to do something. And so in that funeral, I was able to use a couple of these images of cards that kids in our church created and said, I love you, Patrick. That's from a kid. This, this next one saying, God understands. And this last one, literally drawn by a kid at our, at our church, that gave us a picture of Jesus welcoming Patrick in heaven. And we had that celebration service that day. 
to celebrate his life. But what a storm. I mean, what a, a life-altering event to go through. And I don't minimize that at all. As we talk today about storms, as you close, Andrea, what, so what would you say to somebody? What would you want them to take away from what you're saying about God and storms? Um, one of the passages that I really have clung to over the past year and a half um, is actually in Zephaniah 3, and it says, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. Um, for the Lord your God is in your midst. He is a mighty one who will save. And so from that, I kind of clean, you know, God is in my midst. God is in your midst. He is not sitting on his throne with people, you know, waving palm leaves. He is fighting with you. No matter how you feel, I, I felt abandoned by God. I felt um, confused by God and betrayed by God. But my feelings are, are not always based in reality, and neither are yours. So, um, you know, and if you're not able to accept that comfort from God, maybe you're mad at him. I get that. I 100% get that. Um, but that's why he brings people to surround you. So accept that from them because, that you know, he's in that too. Um, just don't forget he is there with you fighting for you no matter how you feel. Yes, I love that. And my, and my favorite picture of them, which I, I continue to keep with me, is this beautiful one of them walking down that path. So you'll, you'll see him again. And you'll see him again. And we'll see Patrick again too. So, if you would, thank Andrea for being so brave. And my, my last thing on that, I want to speak to the the men for a minute. And I, I, I apologize. Anyway, came to the first service. I forgot to mention this piece. That guys, it is it is wonderful to be a spiritual leader in this life, and we need to prepare for when we die. The part of what we do here at Vision, we're relevant. Let me tell you what relevant is. Relevant, guys, is having a will so that if I'm gone before Meg and my kids, that there's something there to take care of them. Now, in Patrick's case, what Andre has told me, they did have a will, they did have insurance, they took care of those things the right way. And actually, we've got somebody in our church who can help you do that. So two weeks from today, after the last service, we'll have a will workshop. And if you say, man, I see some help, figured it out. Because the reality is we, we don't want to think about those things happening but they do happen. So particularly for the men, I'm telling you, serve your family this way and prepare. All right, now let's let's shift and talk about storms and talk about getting in God's words together. How can you make me brave? How can you help me when I go through my storms? And the reality is your storm, whether to me it looks small or big, it's your storm. It's your reality. So we're not going to kind of measure whose storm is bigger or smaller. I want you today thinking about your storm, or particularly our students, the storms you will go through, or possibly even as teenagers you are going through, and to dig into this and say, God, please teach us about storms and how we can survive. Now, in my world, we have storms. Yes, even at you know Pastor Matt, Vanderbilt House, we have storms with, with our marriage, with our finances, raising our kids. You know, medical things where you, know, you get that test or you get that, that thing on, it, on the screen saying, is that what we think? And you get scared. And we get scared. And to give you a little picture, you know, we went through actually a physical storm some years back when uh, my boys were, uh, were, were preschoolers. My daughter was not born yet. We lived in Belmont. We lived in this house, two-story, and above it was this big tree. And I remember one night we woke up in the middle of an ice storm. And it was, like I said, 10-ish, 15 years ago, it was a big ice storm, and you can hear like the ice getting on branches and stuff's crackling, until it dawns on me and Meg that we think the tree leaning over our house is now compromised, and at any second, it could fall on our house. Our preschool boys are sleeping upstairs. Let me tell you, I have never gotten upstairs faster than running up those stairs to snatch our boys, you know, nothing else mattered, clothes, money, wallet, nothing else mattered, but getting those boys Getting out of the house, so get like, God, please, just give me 15 seconds, just 30 seconds. I get them, get out of the house, get in the van, and back up. Ooh, and say, okay, we're, we're safe. That in that moment, we felt what you would call terror. And in the story today, these guys were terrified at what they were going through in their storm. And so in your storm, don't try to avoid your feelings. Don't say, I'm not terrified. It's okay to face it. Say, I am terrified. 
It's okay to talk to God and say, God, I am terrified. Because he wants to help you in your storm. Now, I've got some visuals with us today because I want you to remember it. So, uh, Matthew, have you got my one visual? Because the story today is about guys on a lake. So, of course, I need a boat. So I had to make sure I got a boat that would be, thank you, that would be visually memorable. And it was cool. The person who let me borrow it said, it's vision blue. I said, great. I need something to make it a lot more lighthearted right now in the message. So, so light blue, vision blue, boats. Now, these guys on this lake were terrified. And in this story, a storm came up on them kind of more gradually. Now, sometimes our storms come up immediately. But, you know, in life, you'll be outside and the sky starts getting gray. Thread of rain, or maybe a little drizzle, or maybe the wind kind of starts picking up, or now it's raining more, or maybe like hurricane force winds or rain. This storm just has this, this life to it where it comes up in your life and you feel the terror of being in a storm. And you imagine these guys who are on this lake, and this storm comes up, and they're in a boat, and now things are terrible, literally terrifying. So that leads us to our bottom line today. That is transferable from the guys on the lake to us today. And our bottom line is, to survive the storm, you need to stay close to the king. To survive the storm. So repeat after me. To survive the storm, you need to stay close to the king. Now this king I'm talking about, this guy we sang about earlier, the warrior, the guy with power, that's the king that I will paint a picture of today that I want to implore you to stay close to. That when you get in the storm and want to survive it, being close to the king changes everything. And now, to, to be serious, I, I don't think this boat is going to be something to talk about at work tomorrow or in the neighborhood tomorrow. Say, man, our pastor, he had this boat. So actually, okay, Richard, can, can you guys bring that boat? Because I need a boat that will get into your memories and say, man, they, they had a boat at Vision on Sunday. And you know, whether you take a picture, you pull it off of Facebook Live, and you say, Hey, you got to come to church. They, they, they get boats up there. They, they, they do, you know, I don't know. We, just, so they, we do things different here at Vision. And I appreciate uh, Rich and Kenny bringing this boat up here. So you get a, this feel of the setting. Because in this story, these guys who were experts with boats, they were fishermen. They were comfortable on the water. Thanks, guys. So let me paint the picture of, of the setting lean up to the story. Because... Our story today is coming out of Mark chapter 6. Now, back in Mark chapter 4, there was what I would call storm number 1. And storm number 1 happens to, to these group of guys, these fishermen. But these guys are a little different than us because they have been walking with Jesus. And by my count, they had witnessed nine recorded miracles. Probably more, but at least up to this point in Mark chapter 4. Nine miracles. So you think, man, you hang out with a guy who's done nine miracles? And you think, man, their faith is strong. Man, their faith is rock solid. They have seen water change the wine. They've seen people heal, people raised from the dead. I mean, miraculous hands come back to work. How could your faith not be rock solid? I'm saying, my faith isn't rock solid. I'm trying. I'm hoping. I want my faith to be stronger. But just like these guys in Mark chapter 4, sometimes our faith wavers. Now, I want you to get this with storms, though. Because this, this previous storm... Learning from your past storms helps us better prepare for our future storms. Okay, learning from your past ones helps you better prepare for your future ones. Because this guy, this king, you know, he knows something about living water, right? Remember living water? Hey, was anybody blessed last week by Kevin Collett and the message? Uh, let's hear it fast. Let's hear it fast. Can you hear it? And he talked to us about Jesus, living water. So Mark chapter 4, where this guy who's done nine miracles, and they went through this storm number one where the guys were panicked. They were freaking out. They were on this boat, and they were like, okay, the storm's coming up. The boat maybe is a little bit bigger because Jesus is actually down the bottom. They're like, Jesus, wake up. We're about to die. We're going to die here. Don't you ever feel like in your storm, you're saying to God, God, I am not going to make it through this. I'm going to die. And they're saying, Jesus, don't let us die. He kind of... Comes out of the bottom of the boat. It's like, guys, do you not remember the nine miracles? Do you not remember the things I've done? Do you not remember the, oh, hang on a second. Hey, wind and waves, settle down. And he continues talking. They're like, it's over. The storm is done at his command. That's Mark chapter 4. So our story 
that picks up in Mark chapter 6, wouldn't you think these are guys that have faith to say, this guy handles storms. This guy, he can handle anything. Well, Mark chapter 6, right before storm number 2, something happens. Even if you've probably never been to church before, you probably heard about Jesus feeding like 5,000 people out of a kid's lunchbox. Okay, has anybody heard that story before? Feeding 5,000? Because honestly, he fed 5,000 men. So it was more like 15, 20,000 people. It was the basketball arena in Charlotte, filled with people fed from his lunchbox. Okay, a little lunchbox fed all those people. That is the story that immediately precedes today's story. These guys, they should have faith. I mean, just coming out of the roof, they're like, man, Jesus can do anything. And yet we see in the story that still there's refining that needs to happen in their faith. So let's dig into it. Mark chapter 6, let me read you the story. It's short. It's only a handful of verses. But we're going to learn something from today that's going to teach you some great things. It says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Now, okay, I need a little help with terrified. Because you're like, terrified, scared. No, no. Make the noise you would make if you're terrified. Go like, ah! Do it. Ah! Okay. Well, I need more noise than that. So when I thought about this, prepare so, Okay, I need people that are 25 and under to pretend like you're on the biggest roller coaster in the world. You're about to go over the top and now, terrified. No, 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 no. I, no, no. I need anybody who's in here who's 25 and under, like you're on a roller coaster, terrified, go. That's terrible. Man. Okay, so I need everybody again, man. Terrified, like you're on that, you know, the, uh, the uh, intimidator. You're about to go down. You're scared. You're terrified. Let me hear it. Okay, okay. That's, that's good. That's good. Kevin, okay, you got to work on these youngsters, man. <laughs> All right, terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Now, we're going to unpack all these pieces, but let me, let me start here. You know, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when you get into the Gospels, you will see at times that some of these guys talk about different stories. This story is told in three of the Gospels. And only in one of them, if you know the story at all, in one of them, it talks about this guy, Peter, who walked on the water. And they, all my life, I thought, man, that is incredible. This dude walked on the water. So it confused me when I opened up the book of Mark and I read about it. You know, there, there was no mention of, of Peter walking on the water. And this is what God taught me this week. As I read this and thought about it, I said, God... Why isn't it in this story? I think it's because of this. That sometimes you need to learn about walking on the water. And honestly, sometimes you're not ready for that yet. And today, you are ready for being in that boat and learning about Jesus walking to you and calming the waves. There's going to be another day, not in this series, not this summer, but there's going to be another day when, when God's saying, you need to learn about walking on the water. This is your time to learn that. So I believe when he inspired Mark to put in this account, he said, Mark, when people read this, they need this one nugget. He said, John, when they read yours, they need a different nugget. So make sure you understand, when you read the Gospels, they don't contradict each other when they don't have the same details. They actually strengthen each other. Because it wasn't three guys just recording by memory the exact same thing, had the exact same way. They took different perspectives, and today we're learning from Mark's account. So let's talk about getting on boats. Has anybody in here ever been in a boat in a storm? In a boat in a storm. Okay, has anybody in here ever been on a boat and gone deep sea fishing? Okay, so I'm wondering, did you kind of buy that sales pitch of, it's going to be fun. <laughs> Go with your friends. Beautiful waves and sunshine. And you're about an hour into it, and you're like, heaving over the side. You're looking for a bucket. You're looking for any way off that boat. You're looking for drowning by the, by the bucket. You say, okay, wait a second. Sometimes when you're on a boat, 
and things go bad wrong, man, you'll do anything to get out of that storm. Anything. And these guys, again, experienced men of the water had their lives changed that day on that boat. Because remember, the, the story that preceded it was feeding the 5,000. So that helps you understand this first part when it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. If, I think what Jesus was doing here was he was saying to these guys, look, you were just a part of something awesome. God's power moved in an amazing way, but it's time to move on. Because if, if I'm one of those guys and I'm staying that night, you know, I'm getting up the next morning and people are coming to me like, hey, were you one of those guys? What was he like? Travels with Jesus and, and multiply the food and like, have you got power too? Like, are, are you a miracle worker too? And the reality is that feeds into me and my ego. That feeds into like, hey, I'm, I'm something. I'm hanging with Jesus. And Jesus is like, look, you're not, you're not learning from that wind. You need to move on and learn from what's coming tomorrow. So he says, immediately, get on that boat and go. Look at what Jesus does there. Jesus stays. Jesus gets alone. And Jesus prepares. Because what, Je what Jesus does here is he gives us a bottle that when we want to prepare for what God's going to do, we need to get alone with our Heavenly Father. That's not time to be with the crowd. That's not even time to be with your small group. That's your time to be alone and talk with your Heavenly Father and that's what Jesus did. So Jesus prays. These guys get in the boat. They head to the water. We continue in verse 47. It says, Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. So let's, let's paint this picture. The guys are in the boat. Experienced guys in the boat. I mean, it's not like, you know, you know, me and Mike and Wayne, and we're like, hey, let's, let's try to like work, work the oars, work the rowboats. You know, maybe we're doing okay, maybe not. These guys are veterans on the water, but they're having problems. Because once the wind has come up, and, and this isn't just like, a, oh, the wind's kind of blowing. This is a wind to where they are fearing for their life. I mean, the word terrified. So give me your sound for terrified again, terrified. Okay. They're starting to feel terrified because of what is happening with the water and the wind. They're so terrified that they will do anything they can to get to the shore. But the Bible says they could not. I mean, they're straining with all they have. They're digging at it. They're trying. They're paddling. They can't get to the shore. And I wonder how often we feel like that when we as parents and our kids doing something. Or we as a, a teenager and thinking about the stress of school. Or we as, you know, as a, a single looking to find somebody saying, God, I can't figure this out. I'm in a storm. And you're digging at it. And Jesus, Jesus is over on the side of the lake, and he's not panicked. And in fact, Jesus isn't distracted, and Jesus isn't running late. Jesus is doing exactly what he wants to do in the right time. And what he's doing is he is letting refining happen. He is watching those guys and saying, okay, these, these men... This boat filled with just mortal men are going to be the guys that I am launching my church off of. These are the guys that someday people in Gastonia will have needed to pass on the foundations of Scripture so it makes it to them. He said, I don't need these guys who are just wavering. I don't need these guys who forgot about the miracles. I need these guys who in their toughest moment, they will be refined to have the power of God in them and so Jesus isn't worried, and he's not hurrying, and he's looking at them. And it's interesting, it says, you know, it's almost, it's almost the next morning when he moves. One of the accounts says it's the fourth watch of the night. So Jesus is sitting back there saying, okay, they're, they're really okay in their storm, because there's work happening in that storm. Now it's time for me to move. So this guy, Jesus, starts walking on the lake. And if you've been in church for years, you're like, Okay, so he like walked on the lake to him, did whatever. Now, do you understand? This is the first time in history that somebody has walked on water. This is Jesus when he was, he was sitting there praying, saying, Father, I need command over nature right now. I need to do something no one's ever done before. I'm going to walk on this water and spend time with these guys, shaping them in a way 
that they could never do on their own. Give me that power so I can transfer power to them. He walks on it. He walks it out. Now, walking on the water is impossible for us. Now, I saw something posted this week. And you can take a look at this picture because one of our visionaries here, Corey, it looked like he's walking on water. And I'm like, okay, I figured Corey would be here today. Like, thanks, Corey. Perfect timing on that picture. But the reality is, we step on water, we fall down. Jesus steps on water, and it does whatever he wants it to do. So he walks out in this water, and it's where these guys. All right, now, if I get my guys to come take our boat, and I get Megan to come play, because I, I need you locked in on these next couple minutes. Because Jesus, when he's walking out toward that boat, look at what it says here. It says, he, Jesus, was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. So Jesus, don't miss it, he was about to walk past the boat. He, he wasn't just going to stop. He needed to be needed. In your storm, God is not going to impose his will on you. He is not going to get in your space and say, I'm here to walk you through it. Come on, I'm going to walk you through it. God's going to say, I'm, I'm here to walk through it. And Jesus, when he goes walking with the intention of going past that boat, he's saying, if you want me to stop, I'll stop. But these guys, they're, they're straining and they're digging and they're doing everything they can to beat that storm, and they just about missed him. I mean, you imagine, you're here digging and you're like not even looking out. And suddenly you see it, and man, your head is so messed up, you think it's a ghost. Now you're terrified about the ghost. You're terrified about the wind. And Jesus merely says, do you want me to help? He says, take my hand, take courage, be brave. He says, it's me. It's me. I'm with you in your storm. I'm with you to find the solution. I'm with you to give you power that you don't have on your own. He said, if you want me to, I'll step in that boat and I'll be in that storm with you. And they welcome him in the boat. And immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. Take courage. Be brave. It's I. Don't be afraid. He climbed in that boat and of course the wind died down. He's got control over that wind. He's got control over that water. He's got control over that sun, that moon, anything. That wind dies down. They were completely amazed. And, and don't miss this piece. It says, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Remember the loaves, the 5,000, the 15,000, 20,000 that were fed? They came out of that somehow with their hearts still hardened about understanding Jesus. I don't understand that, but to be fair, I come out of miracles as well, and sometimes my heart is still hard. And I get to the next storm, I say, God, where are you at? And he says, man, I was just there. Why are you letting your heart be hard? So for us today, I got you three questions that I want you to consider to help you survive the storms of life. They're not complicated because really what the guys did in the boat was not complicated. What they did is the first question they asked is, okay, where, where are your feet? Where are your feet? What, literally, what is the foundation you're standing on? And I'm not talking about the metal of a boat. I'm talking about the rock of Jesus Christ. Where are your feet? What's your foundation? Is it you? Is it your spouse? Is it your job, your money, whatever? And it, it's, it's going to crumble. And on your takeaway card, whether on paper or on the, the Bible app, I want you to dig it in this week to what I put for these. Where are your feet? The foundation, you dig into Matthew 7. And you read about the foundation Jesus talked about. And if you want another piece to reinforce it, then you get on Spotify or Pandora or YouTube and you listen to this song by Passion and Charlie Hall, The Solid Rock. You say, okay, I'm going to read the word. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to think on this and say, where are my feet in the storm? My feet are on the foundation of Christ. The second question, where are your eyes? Because these guys, when they were there in that boat, their eyes are locked in. Their eyes are seeing waves. Their eyes are seeing work. Their eyes aren't seeing the kingdom. Said, where are your eyes? What are you looking at? What are you focused on in your storm? 
Jesus says, focus on me. Take courage. It's, it's me. Don't be afraid. So your eyes. I love in Hebrews 12. It talks about running this race with perseverance and fixing your eyes on our leader, on the king. Dig into it this week. And along with that then, you find that song from King and Country. It says, fix my eyes. Now, I'm going to fix my eyes on you, Jesus. I'm going to do that so that where are my feet? Where are my eyes? But really the key of this is, man, where is your heart? Because you, you, you can kind of stand on those feet and you can look for Jesus, but if your heart is not with him, he's going to walk right on by. He's not going to stop at that boat. He's not going to be available, but he is totally available if you're fixing your heart on him. And to me, that's twofold. Number one is accepting him as your Savior for the first time. In Romans, when it says, anybody who calls on him, anybody who says, Jesus, please, you'll be saved. And I love this, this song where it talks about my heart being yours from, from passion. And we sing it here. And you listen to it and say, God, my heart's yours. Oh, my heart is yours. Yes, God, I, I want my heart to be yours through salvation and my heart to be yours daily through what I call recalibration. Because if you're like me, my heart kind of gets off track. I don't, I don't lose my salvation, but it gets off track to where, okay, my feet, where are they? My eyes, where are they? But my heart is kind of drifting. It's okay. My heart is on Christ every day. God, recalibrate it. Like Jesus spent time with the Father one-on-one, -on -one, we need to spend time with God one-on-one -on -one to recalibrate our hearts. Remember this bottom line? To survive the storm, you have to be close to the king. That comes from your feet, your eyes, your heart. So when you are in that eye of the storm, he will carry you through. 